<laughs> Maybe we should go again because I was looking at my phone. Oh, oh that's okay. Okay, ready? Yeah, ready? Ready? Yeah, I got it. It's, I can edit it, so it's fine. Plus, it'll be funny. Hello, and welcome back, everybody, to the Fearless Training United podcast. This is the first of the series of the Raw Knowledge. And if you're watching this as well, we probably uploaded it to a YouTube video or we condensed it down to a YouTube video as well. So this is everything training, nutrition, lifestyle, and today I'm joined by friend, fellow athlete, and professional Yuri Rus. Am I pronouncing that right, Yuri? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> Yuri is Slovenian. I'm representing the shirt today. Uh, so if I mispronounce things, I'm sure Yuri will correct me. Now, we're gonna be going through some Q&A, pretty much just deriving some of the best tactics, basic skills, anything that will contribute to help you guys achieve your health and fitness goals, especially if you're a strength-based athlete. I'm gonna let Yuri do the talking uh, for him mostly, but uh, to give him a bit of an introduction, he's the strongest man in Slovenia. The strongest power lifter. Strongest power lifter. Not, not the strongest man. <laughs> we have some, uh, we have a really good strong men. Okay, fair enough. So there you go. They, they are stronger usually than power lifters. Uh, but they don't look as jacked as you. <laughs> so he's like a power builder, which I'm sure you'll see. And we're gonna flick between some clips as well of Yuri's training, my training, and you can see the difference between more of the power lifting focus and more the you know the bodybuilding focus, if you like. Yuri, maybe a bit of an introduction. Tell people a bit about you know yourself, how you got into lifting, what you mainly do as a powerlifter, where you're based, and I guess just some basic, you know. Yeah, actually, I used to play soccer. Okay. Uh, back, okay. Yeah, back yeah. in Slovenia. So that was up until the age of fifteen, something like that. Yeah. I started training with weights just to be better at soccer. Uh, with at around 12, 13 mm -hmm. years of age. Uh, I started training at home. Uh, I just bought some equipment for like 100 euros. Uh, it was a bench with some very basic uh, uh, extras. And I was just hitting that like every day for a few hours. Nice. And I noticed the uh, first signs of uh, uh, progress uh, after a few months. And then I think that after a year or so, when I finished my primary school and when I enrolled to high school, uh, I went to the local gym right? Okay. and I started training more, uh, I wouldn't say more seriously, I would say maybe I was exposed to more equipment. Okay. So and I, you would have been about what, like 13, uh, 14 uh, or something? Uh, 15. About 15, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so then I, I started training as a typical bodybuilder. That was around two, 2005, 2006. So there wasn't so many maybe info about training or uh, training specific material mm -hmm. on online at that time yet. So what if you just googled training or strength training, it was usually sort of a bodybuilding uh, uh, style of training. Yeah, it wasn't really like as popular yet. Yeah, or yeah. As, as no, no, I th I don't think anybody knew anything about maybe power building or powerlifting specific training back then. Okay. So you, you, you would have powerlifters, even in Slovenia, some, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say that they were following some progressive overloads or some seriously structured uh, training plans. They were just training. Yeah, it was more like intuitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just maybe things that yeah, they read yeah, and want to like have yeah. any coaching or anything yeah. like that. But I would say that the majority of the things you could read were about bodybuilding. So I got into bodybuilding. Um, I never wanted to do drugs, so performance enhancing substances. So that's why I stick to being a natural lifter throughout the years. Um, so I started training at the gym uh, probably in 2006. Right. Okay. And my first comp was in 2009. And this was obviously in bodybuilding. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I, I think I was 17. Yeah. Yeah. How, so how did that go for you, that first comp? Like, you obviously learned I actually from won. From it. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Uh, it was a junior division. I think it was sort of a fitness class, something mm. like that. My last one was in 2013. Uh, I think in November in Miami. Um, yes. And that was it. And in 2014, 2015, I got... Uh, keen on body uh, on powerlifting 
what what was the like do you remember was it what is it a time or a place or someone you met that made you kind of go you know powerlifting i'm, I'm thinking this is going to be better for me was can so, you kind of pinpoint it when you so made in the in the first years of training i was doing that typical bodybuilding split mm. like every muscle group once per week maybe twice uh, 8 to 12 rep range and everything like that uh, and then as I progressed I realized that you have to train heavy or heavier to progress as a natural bodybuilder mm-hmm. so basically what I did was just I started including some some sets of three to five or something like that uh, on the compound movement like squat, bench press, deadlift. Uh, so you you kind of start training with heavier weights. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You get more into a power building style of training. A bit of a hybrid. Yeah. So were, were you sorry to interrupt, but were you before powerlifting? You were obviously squatting, benching, deadlifting. Did you understand the importance I actually, of it then? No. Or was it only when you no. started powerlifting? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I wouldn't say that. I, so when I started doing the this three compound movement that are that are actually essential to any lifting program, mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, say that I was a power lifter then, because I was still a bodybuilder. I just realized that I have to train with heavier weights to improve. Yes, because you you can do eight to twelve all day long, but you can get only so much out of it yeah so you you just have to go heavy sometimes yeah first ipf nationals in 2015 and my first international meet was 2016 um, and then actually in 2017 i won the european um, 83 class um, so that's i would say that's the biggest uh, achievement uh, my biggest achievement in powerlifting so far. Yeah, so yeah, it's pretty um, yeah. impressive. Yeah. And you've always been, obviously you were born in Slovenia, you've been based there most of your life, and you've competed in bodybuilding and now powerlifting away from those areas. Do you think that from the places that you've been to uh, and visited and competed in, obviously you've made friends and connections, or is there anywhere else that you think, oh, you know, that would be a, a great place to base myself for your sport? Um, in terms of like, do you think there'd be a benefit to say living in America or somewhere like you know Australia for a powerlifter? For you know, I imagine I don't know if you're gonna get into bodybuilding again, but do you think there is a better environment for it? Like you mentioned, there wasn't much in Europe at that time. Yeah, I, I would say I would, I would say that as far as powerlifting is concerned, you you have quite a lot of good meets in Europe. Yeah. Um, at that time, so in a few years ago, when I was still competing in bodybuilding, there were no bodybuilding uh, or very few bodybuilding, natural bodybuilding competitions. Mm-hmm. So at that time, I would say, yeah, it's better if you lived in the States or maybe here. Um, honestly, I don't know exactly how it is now, but I can imagine that things have improved. Yeah. So probably yeah, right now, it doesn't matter where you live. Um, but as far as let's say powerlifting goes uh, and Slovenian powerlifting, uh, we get no funding from the government. There are basically no. Um, there's not much support. Yeah, there's in, no in support. The yeah. yeah, so we have to buy our own uh, powerlifting equipment, powerlifting specific equipment. Uh, so let's say up to a few years ago, there were no calibrated plates almost in the whole country, mm-hmm. or no bars and. I own a gym in Slovenia, so yeah, then I just bought some uh, IPF approved uh, racks, uh, rack, uh, yeah, racks, bars, uh, plates, mm-hmm. just to get the sport uh, going. Going again. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so now it, it, it's become better. I'm just gonna check the camera, it's still on. I think when we are doing like this, it, the phone is a bit uh, shaky. I'm gonna hash this up into the segments. Okay. Wherever you do. I'll show you, it'll be good. You own a gym. In Slovenia, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? How you sort of got into owning a gym? What your gym is obviously based around? I imagine more powerlifting, and then also, do you work within the gym? You know, what do you do for work? Obviously, I know, but you know, tell the viewers, you know, how what you do for work, what your profession is, and how that aligns with your sort of powerlifting goals. 
So basically, I've I've had the gym for five years now. Mm -hmm. I think it was five five years in November. Um, I was still a student back then, uh, then, and I just wanted a place to train. And then the the most reasonable thing seemed to be to just open a gym mm -hmm. uh, and try to make sort of a small business out of it. Not not to make money, but just to maybe build an environment for people to train. Mm -hmm. I would say owning a gym is a lot harder than it maybe yeah. it looks like at first sight. Yeah, I find it's, it's really popular now. Everyone, but well, there's a lot of people that get into the fitness industry, whether it's personal training or coaching, yeah. or just becoming a lifter and they want to own a gym. And I'm, I'm not quite sure if they're aware of, you know, everything that's involved with running yeah, a gym. Yeah. And it, now, it, it, yeah, you, it's know, you obviously know that. I'd say if you're a personal trainer, that's in love with personal training and you want to train clients I would my advice is not to open a gym because, because you don't have the time because then yeah you have to spend a few hours a day maybe doing something at the gym mm -hmm. or on the gym or whatever uh, and you basically lose time for your clients or you just have to put in some extra hours um, so yeah, basically, if you want to be a personal trainer, just find a good gym and train your clients there. Easy to open a gym, mm -hmm. but to to have it running for several years, it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah, it's, it's a it, different story, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Especially when you've got the big gym chains around. Yeah. You, if you're opening a gym, I find or a facility, you gotta uh, you've got to be very niche and know that depending demographically where you are, I think. Do you have you know those clientele around you, and do you have a large following as maybe a trainer or a coach or someone that's already established within yeah. your area to be able to provide that momentum? Because like you said, you know it's a new gym pops up and it can be a bit of a novelty. You know you get the people who want to join because it's the new gym, but if it's not part of a chain or you can't provide the service of you know you, you know, like you said you're going to have other competing gyms, then it kind of fades away a little bit. Yeah. So I guess you've done really well to, to sustain that. Besides owning a gym, I'm actually a dentist. Right. I opened my own private practice uh, so in 2017. Uh, and I actually went into a partnership with a good friend of mine uh, last year in 2018. And we moved to new uh, facilities uh, like half a year ago. And yeah, yeah it, it's been going really well. Uh, so that's my main thing. Um, that takes up most of my time. Yeah. So I, which, you, which you're very passionate about. Yeah. I've usually, I, I work like fifty to sixty hours weekly. Uh, so, yeah, and, and then you add up, you add in training sessions, <laughs> and maybe some work uh, in the gym. And uh, and for those of you listening and watching, uh, when when me and Matt, uh, when me and Yuri uh, Matt and Eva uh, Yuri's now wife uh, a couple of years ago you've made a lot of progress since then in terms of, I mean, not only your lifting, but your working career, like opening up this new facility. And you know, I think that's kudos to you as well. So how do you find then for, for other people out there who have a really busy schedule and they're very serious about their training and their lifting, is there any strategies that you've learned or that you implement to help you kind of get your training in efficiently as well as obviously you know you're running a gym and you know you're you're full-time <laughs> Yuri uh, you can find Yuri I'll put his links in the description below but he's the power dentist <laughs> as he refers himself <laughs> to uh, which is pretty cool I think but yeah so maybe talk a little bit about how you make all that work in in the busy schedule that we all have today yeah basically most of the time it's hard work but when you're working for something that's your passion it's usually not hard but yeah it takes a lot of your time uh, but then again I always say that if I wasn't training I wouldn't be a s successful dentist because if your mind is only in I don't know, a certain field and you only do that all day every day it's after a while, you you just you're not as effective or maybe not as enthusiastic about it, mm -hmm. and we tend to procrastinate a lot, people in general. Yeah. So Agreed. the ones <laughs> the ones that are usually saying, "Oh, I don't have time," they have like six hours a day. 
you your attention is on one thing but you believe you need to have other things as well to sustain. Yeah, so so I, I think yeah. it's really important to have several different things in life because let's say I'm a power lifter. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I get injured because I have so many other things going on, it's not so devastating. Dentistry is quite a demanding profession. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in addition to always have to having to learn something, yeah. Uh, it's also physically quite demanding because, because you're on your feet all day. Uh, well, I actually, think. we're sitting all day, and you are into you're sort of uh, in an you're using in, in a like yeah in, in a forced skills. position. Yeah, it's quite cause it because it requires a lot of focus. A lot of focus, and you always want to adapt to the patient, so you want to make it as pleasant for the patient as possible. I think even with every other profession, uh, you just at least three, two to three times a week, you have to be active. Mm-hmm. And uh, ideal, ideally, uh, you do sort of a strength training two to three times a week, yeah. just to stay fit. Do you think this is for everyone who's in that kind of role or just for dentistry? No, I, I would say that for basically anybody. Yeah, yeah. which we, we, I'm yeah. Sure and we if, are both believers of the, the benefits of strength training, regardless of whether it's for yeah, performance yeah. or just, you know, health in general, like yeah. we know it's beneficial yeah. to do. But the paradox of working out is I find even though you spend more energy, it almost seems to give you more energy yeah. In, yeah. in a yeah. you know, in a physical and a mental yeah. sense, you're oh. in a better mind. Yeah. Often after a long day of work, I feel exhausted. Mm-hmm. It's mostly probably mentally. Because you're so focused yeah. on the Then I drag drugs. myself to the gym and during the session, yeah, it's kind of I'm reborn. Yeah. You should do everything in moderation, mm-hmm. even training-wise. I, w- I would say overtraining and maybe overthinking about training. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't make er- er- everything in your life about, or, training. Yeah, about training. Did you need that balance? Be- yeah, if you're not a professional athlete in bodybuilding and powerlifting, is me- is measured in years, not not in months. Yeah, I think you made some really good points there, Yuri, about the mental health of the sport, you know, the physical health, some really good mind frames to have if you're within the sport. And like you said, if you want to do this for a long time and, and you know, I always say, you know, the flexibility, sustainability and something that you enjoy, it's got to tick those boxes because again, you know, if you are a natural natural athlete out there, um, you are in this for the long run, you know, as you said, it takes years, you, you're going to be spending a lot of hours and a lot of time in the gym. So you want to make sure you enjoy it. And I think a lot of people, go into the gym and that's probably why they don't last because they're not truly passionate about it and they expect to see results that you might get in say 10 years in sort of one to two years and yeah. then they get yeah. deterred let's talk more about your specific training and maybe your coaches so you're, you're coached by the strength guys at the minute i'm sure people are going to be quite interested because you have quite like for a power lifter and you won't mind me saying this but you are you're very well conditioned you're quite you're quite lean you look more like a bodybuilder or a hybrid in terms of you're quite well-rounded you're quite symmetrical etc and i think this is a really good example of how well and again we've talked about this a lot ourselves the basics work if you can do them efficiently and why sticking to the basics of strength training is advantageous if you even are after aesthetics as your your base and your groundwork so maybe talk us through a little bit about your training how you train, how you've trained, maybe how it's changed, um, so people can kind of gain that um, insight. Because there's a lot of people out there who see a physique like yours, and, excuse me, it might be marketed very differently. We know there's a lot of clever marketing tactics out there, whether it's guys using, and girls using performance enhancing drugs, or they are promoting something that really is not in alignment to how they achieve that physique. So I think it's really good, again, you know, we want to get the truth out there, people are going to want to know what it takes to look I think you know the, or have the physique like you have and they have a completely different ideology of what it actually takes so maybe shed some light on that for us actually training is not as complicated as they are trying to make it mm-hmm. basically you just have to stick with some very basic com- compound movements and just perform them for a long, long time, and just sort of do, uh, just do a progressive overload. So gradually increasing weights over time. Yeah, and yeah. that's basically it. Yeah, 
the problem Simple. yeah the problem you don't hear about this very often is that you can't really sell this correct train each muscle group several times a week with compound movements mm -hmm. such as squats presses so bench pressing dips um i don't know so oh, bad press yeah stuff like that. so basically right. just for the lower part it's mostly squats and some pulling uh, motions such as deadlifts mm -hmm. For the upper part, body part, you can basically just push something away from you mm -hmm. or pull something towards you mm -hmm. and that's it. So having a main focus just for in one movement for the lower body and maybe two or three exercises for the upper body. So maybe one or two pushing movements and one or two uh, pulling movements. That, that's it. That's all you need. Yeah. Do this four times a week for five to ten years and I'm sure that you'll look good if you do a progressive overload so that means that over time you should be lifting more but again I think most people are focusing on like you said those latter things that aren't as important like you say they're focusing on a specific exercise or maybe the tempo where really that's not the most important yeah. thing it's actually can you perform the basic lifts correctly yeah can and and perform them time? i don't know anywhere from five to 12 reps mm -hmm. and that's it so there you go nice and simple yeah. when you were bodybuilding because i'm sure people might say hey well it's all right for you to say that now but when you're a bodybuilder did you train a certain way so maybe like just a, like so basically like, like i said before i spent the first few years of uh, my uh, when i started training uh, I trained like uh, as a bodybuilder, as mm -hmm. a typical bodybuilder. So I did maybe one or two muscle groups per training, yeah, a few times a week, and that's it. Yep. Because power building for me yeah, is just a mixture of some very basic movements that work, and uh, combined with just a few accessory maybe more bodybuilding style yeah. uh, movements. So more like specific isolation yeah. exercises. Yeah. And I think that if you want to look great and be decent, strong, yeah, yeah that, that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. So basically what I did was changing from completely bodybuilding uh, movements, so mostly uh, isolation work, mm -hmm. to incorporating more and more compound movements. And, uh, and when I did that, I, I uh, improved the most. You uh, find you responded quite well to weight training? Like in I wouldn't opinion. say so that back then, but I, I just put in work yep. and after a few years. So it, it's interesting. Uh, in, first, in first, let's say, three years, mm -hmm. nobody said I was uh, uh, genetically gifted. Yes. It wasn't uh, until after training for let's say five years that people started saying, "Oh yeah, it's easy for you. You you're genetically gifted." Uh, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, okay. Where where were you a year or two ago when I was already training for <laughs> several years? I went to high school. I think I had like fifty kilos, and now I have eighty three. Yeah, and and to give some context, and, and that how tall are you? About five seven? Oh yeah, five, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm um, one hundred seventy three. There you, go. there you yeah. go. We can live in a society where everyone wants that instant gratification, whether it's through social media, you know, television and patients, whatever it is. And really everyone's kind of focused on what they can't control. Like they said, people are very quick to go, oh, you know, genetics or I can't do this because of that. And the blaming things that they're not in control of where if they're just focused on the things that they can control, like, you know, their training, their nutrition, their mindset, and they were consistent with it, they might find that actually, you know what? They probably got better results or yeah. get better results than they and, actually and believe. And everybody uh, can be a better version of themselves. Agreed. I think at any point. So even if you're an advanced lifter or if you're a beginner, it doesn't matter what kind of a genetic background you have. Mm. From your point of view, if you train harder, you will be a better athlete or person. Run us through your current training split, and then we'll we'll sort of talk nutrition and, and so I have from there. I have my training organized by the strength guys. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason and Ben are the head uh, are my coaches. Yeah. So they do sort of a co coaching with a, which I think is a great idea, 
because two uh, bangs are better than one yeah which yeah. we'll link in the description guys so you can follow that yeah. and watching. it's been great i i've been with them since march last year uh so after the arnold's in ohio uh i've made some i think pretty good progress unfortunately i had some minor uh back tweaks just before the meets i was going to do so I, we didn't uh, i haven't done a competition since being with them but i think this year in 2019 we will finally be able to show the progress so before starting with the, the strength guys i was training myself i was my own coach late 2017 mm -hmm. and that was when i i started to think about getting a coach because I had so many things going on with dental practice and patients with the gym and everything that I just wanted to have someone that would be in charge of my training and I just wanted to go to the gym and do what I'm told yeah I not have to think about it for once yeah yeah uh, and when the strength guys when Jason uh, contacted me through an email I was so surprised and uh, uh, happy so my training split now uh, usually looks uh, something like this so I have four training days a week I would do squats and bench pressing two to three times a week mm -hmm. and deadlifts one to two times a week depending wow. on the uh, uh, cycle I'm in so the training cycle I'm yeah. in um, Right now, I'm just sort of transitioning from the off-season phase to the contest prep phase. My next competition is uh, in March, I think late March. So we have now about 10, 12 weeks to get yeah, ready. Not too far away. Yeah. So you're so soon you'll start peaking into that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So competition, I imagine. now after the New Year's, we will gradually gradually be going back to the heavier weights right. uh, and just try to surpass my uh, PRs. It's four hours, uh, four days a week for about two hours um, and that's it. It's mostly just basic movements without some uh, variation. Mm -hmm. So if I do squats, I almost exclusively just do competition squats. If I do bench pressing, I just do regular bench pressing. If I do deadlifts, uh, I do my comp deadlifts and that's it. Yeah, so it's very sport specific. Yeah, and, very and it's, basic, and it's very, very simple. simple, yeah. And uh, I have some uh, accessories such as, I don't know, some rowing movements mm -hmm. or some uh, maybe pressing movements, uh, but that's it. As far as nutrition goes, uh, I'm not following any nutritional program. Yeah, you uh, don't count calories or Yeah, I don't like count yeah. anything. I just eat whatever I like. Yeah. But you, I think the viewers should have in mind that I was tracking my calories for like eight years. So You have I, a good understanding. Yeah, I stopped tracking out. my macros about three to four years ago. Mm -hmm. And since then I was just going you're like eating intuitively as yeah. they say you yeah. know, you're yeah. eating mindfully as yeah. whatever you yeah. want to put it across yeah. so right now I'm at about 84 kilos I compete in the 83 uh, weight class in the IPF um, and basically it's been easy for me to sustain this uh, to stay at this weight um, and that's it yeah. and what sort of food groups do you, you generally eat or maybe run us through a typical day um, if you oh, do eat very similar, or do you, do you is it very transient? Is it very different? Like, or maybe just the main foods that you like to eat, because I'm sure that people are interested to know what. So I, I, such a powerful. It rib. probably comes from my bodybuilding years, but I don't like to have maybe fatty foods. Yeah. So I eat a lot of sugar and candy and everything. Yeah. I'm just not. So I prefer high carb, low fat diet or mm -hmm. lifestyle compared to maybe high fat or low carb yeah i yeah. tend to feel better if i eat a lot of carbs and less fat that i have anywhere from one to ten meals a day mm -hmm. uh, i try to get in as much protein as possible if you had to guess what what calories and macros do you think that you fluctuate within if we had to I, I would say that on meal. average i eat for around three thousand calories per day yeah uh, and that's it sometimes it may be 
Yeah, but if you're hungry, you eat. If you're if not I'm hungry, hungry, I eat. Yeah, eat. you eat you with food groups. You just that, eat whatever. Yeah, it's pretty basic. Yeah, yeah. if yeah. it's high carb and at least moderate to low fat, it, I'm I'm gonna eat. So yeah. I'm not. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So again, I I, I really I really <laughs> I really don't complicate it when it comes to my intake. So which I think is a bit of a theme with your whole philosophy, which is I think is a really good takeaway. It's important for anybody to track their macros at uh-huh. least for some time to get that basic yeah. understanding initially yeah. and then transition yeah, yeah. because you yes. kind of get that feeling of what you're eating what what your intake is uh, yeah. what certain food groups maybe even look like or mm-hmm. mean most people when you start you don't understand even sometimes how to read a food label you don't actually yeah. i think most people are underestimating how much they eat they have no perception. It's almost like when you're young, you don't really perceive hot and cold the same as when you're older. And it's the same with calories. So when you start tracking them, it just it lays up. I mean, and I'm an advocate of starting that way or at least having some sort of structure because it does give you a bit of a better understanding. So then you can go forth more successfully in the future and transition away from that without having, obviously, eating mm. disorders, uh, etc. because you're not totally just focused on calories or eating too much or not eating enough or binging or whatever it is. I'm just gonna ask you some really, really basic, simple questions and I want you to just give the shortest answer you can. Do you have a favorite food and if so, what is it? So if you have to pick like a, a, a dessert or a, say a main or dessert, like a sweet and a <laughs> You wanted to say apple strudel? No, I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> you should see his yeah, apple strudel, I, I, it's pretty I, epic. I, I love uh, uh, apple strudel there and I love ice cream. It's a secret to the game. So games. basically I, I could eat ice cream every day, all day. I think we have that in common, yeah. definitely. Any particular flavor or just anything? No, the, 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 just the plain maybe vanilla, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good. But I like the... Uh, the fruit ones, yeah, I, yeah. I don't like the more refreshing ones. Yeah, I don't prefer the chocolate ones or the cookie ones. So. Yeah, and do you have a favorite color? And if so, what? No, no, you're no. just neutral. You don't I'm mind. neutral. What about favorite music? And that can just be like when you're training, or is there anything that you like to listen to specifically, or you're just not no, bothered? No, actually, I, I've spent so much time working uh, at the gym, and I actually throughout the years I've worked at several gyms that I, I sort of became immune to music but I can train without music just as good yeah so probably not a bad thing when yeah. you're competing as a powerlifter yeah. if, if you could wake up anywhere in the world tomorrow and like you know just anywhere there's no whole bars where would it be and why would it be would it be here in Australia right yeah. now yeah yeah would, would it be still here yeah, yeah. why I don't know the lifestyle here is just so it's it's different than from what we have back at home, but mm-hmm. I think it's just the right mixture of the American and European lifestyle. It's a nice balance. Yeah. yeah. What is one of the, the biggest fears in your life that you've overcome and what helped you overcome it? I'm fearless. Yeah, well, there you go. How's that? That's the perfect answer, isn't it? Fearless training. <laughs> the, the thing I was probably the most afraid of was when I was younger, I was always thinking, okay, I hope I'll be proud of myself when I'm older. Okay. So when I'm, let's say, 25, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe looking back to my early 20s, I always wanted to be proud of my recent past or recent years. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that was my biggest fear, that someday I would turn back. Uh, have a look and, and just be yeah and I would just be oh yeah what, what have I done with my life yeah. so maybe that was one of the things that kept me uh, that, that pushed me through the years to to, to succeed and achieve what yeah. you achieved yeah. and, and to continue on yeah. yeah I think that's a great way to, to end a great conversation I think we've talked about a lot of really good points that are very popular in the fitness industry and the health and fitness industry at the minute. I think there's a lot you guys can take away listening from this. Um, I think some of the key things that I've learned myself from my time that I've known you is the simplicity aspect of it, of not overthinking things, sticking to the basics, having the faith, turning up, putting that work in and not really stressing about those little things, which I think we can all take a leap out of your book from Yuri. So, Thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been great having you here in Australia. And I'm sure we will do another 
sector or another series, if you like, when I come and finally visit yeah. Slovenia, yeah. which I hope to do at the end of the year, guys. Um, I will put links to Yuri's Instagram in, in the section below. So you can keep up to date with him and check out his lifts and anything relevant that we've talked to in the podcast and the video. Again, guys, if you liked it, like, share, subscribe. If you think someone will benefit from this as well, stay tuned for many more. And Yuri, thank you again. Best of luck with your upcoming powerlifting competition in March. I'm sure you're going to destroy it and uh, achieve some great things. So I look forward to seeing your progress. Thank you for having me. It was a great time. Fantastic. Cheers, brother. We'll catch you next time, guys. And as always, stay fearless. Hey. Cheers, brother.